Hey everyone, I'm excited to share this interview that I did for the Health Further podcast with Dr. Kyra Bobinet. She and I have known each other for several years now and I always find our conversations very enlightening and a variety of different perspectives and ideas that come forth through the conversation. Unfortunately, the video side crapped out about 35 minutes into the recording and couldn't salvage that, but we do have a nice uh, audio copy that you, we can share with some static image. So please forgive the uh, video mishap and hope you enjoy the conversation that we had together. Awesome. Well, I'm delighted to be here with Dr. Kyra Bobinet and as a guest host on the Health Further podcast, we will see how this goes and whether or not I am invited to come back and help host another episode in the future. Um, but first, I know we're all super busy, but thank you so much, Kyra, for joining us for what should be a fun conversation together. Yeah, I'm super excited about it. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this. And um, you. you and I have known each other for several years now, and I, I've known facets of all the various experiences that you've had. And I always look forward to our conversations because we, we each share and differ in so many different aspects of how large this healthcare ecosystem is. But for those who aren't familiar, I know reading up and down your bio, there are just a lot of fun, interesting nuggets that you've had in your experiences. Uh, a physician, an author, an instructor at Stanford. You and I were just talking about your, the work you've done with ABC7 during our, our prep, um, an entrepreneur with serial startups and entrepreneur activities. So it's all fantastic background that you could read from your bio. What's something that most people might not know about you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So something that most people don't know about me is that I actually started a nonprofit when I left medicine and I was working in juvenile hall with young uh, African-American, uh, Latino-American, uh, different young men of color in uh, who are in games. And, you know, started out in health education, you know, trying to teach them about their bodies and health and things like that. And very, very quickly went in the direction of youth development. And in particular, being outdoors in nature to kind of disarm them and kind of get their attention. And so for about 10 years, every Saturday, I would go to this detention facility outside of Woodside, one of the most wealthy communities in the planet. And there's this little tucked away ranch there. And I would be barefoot and out in the rain and just crawling around on the ground uh, with these young people who actually up close and personal are very safe to be around in many cases. They, they have a bad reputation. But what I found and what I learned from that is that folks is folks, you know, people are people. And if you really uh, get to know people, there are no barriers. We're all connected. And they were my greatest teachers because anytime that I would show up with any sort of ego or arrogance or I, I'm, I'm a doctor and you listen to me, they would smack me down like that. Not, not literally, but they would, they would uh, avoid me. They would uh, get angry with me. It was like looking in the mirror of my own insecurity. And so through that constant feedback loop, they polished me into a pretty decent person to be around. That's amazing. I was going to put you on the spot and ask you what those experiences taught you about yourself, but you went, you went right there. I think, you know, those types yeah. of experiences and environments we all walk in with preconceived notions and stereotypes and judgments and biases. And as you say, people are people, you know, getting to know each other in a safe space, but also disarm any preconceived notions. It sounds like yeah. a very uh, amazing and intimate exp set of experiences that would come through something like that. That's right. That's right. And, and just, you know, for me, uh, the word equanimity comes up, you know, equanimity means that you don't have a bias here or there. And oftentimes, you know, my work right now is trying to uncover the bias and design for that bias. 
Um, but once you put yourself in a position where you have to cross every demograph and way that we define ourselves as humans that separate us, if you can do that, then you really uh, receive so much more than you give and, and, and it heals you. And so I am a huge advocate of service leadership and being vulnerable and putting yourself out there and really, uh, you know, going to what you're afraid of. Yeah. I'm glad you defined that word because I'm not sure I would have been able to get that definition <laughs> spot on. In, in case you didn't know, you're right. on the, the Scrabble podcast word of the day as well. There you go. That's right. Cool. Well, um, speaking of words, you know, you, you, you have some authorship under your belt, which is one of my bucket list goals to write uh, a book or two sometime in the future. And um, your book is entitled, I'm going to read this off just to make sure I get all the words right. The book is entitled, oh, Well-Designed Life, 10 Lessons in Brain Science and Design Thinking for a Mindful, Healthy, and Purposeful Life. It's a lot. That's right. There's a, there's a lot it there. Um, it is. Thinking about that book, I think about the, the healthcare ecosystem that we live in and, you know, those lessons that you wrote about, what are the top things that come to mind for patients? Because it's something we can all relate to, having to engage yeah. in the healthcare system what would you say to the patients out there from your learnings? You know, I think the biggest thing is this, is unpacking this mystery of, I know what I should do. I don't know why I don't do it. That's something that afflicts all of us. And over and over again, whether I was being a clinician or whether I was designing large-scale interventions like at Aetna when I was medical director there, it was a theme that kept coming up over and over again. I think it's a universal theme for all of us in healthcare. And, and as a patient, when I'm a patient, that's something that I have to figure out every single time. And so for me, you know, the, the reason why I got to brain science is that it was the source of all of this. It's the source of all of our behavior. And so it makes sense to know how this thing works. And so much, you know, ignorance is, is out there. And, and so we end up dealing with very surface uh, kind of reactive um, ways of solving our problems. But if you know the source and if you understand how this works, then you are empowered. You are able to do things on purpose. And I have this, you know, saying, design or be designed, you know, like it's our job to sit in the seat of our power as a patient. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is to know the car we're driving, you know, the, the vehicle that we're operating up here. That's cool. You, I think you and I are on parallel wavelengths. I have a phrase, create Absolutely. or be created. You know, you're, yeah. you're either helping define your environment that you live in, or you can help contribute and shape to it and be more in charge. Um, so, Absolutely. So that, that challenge that you lay out there, doing the right things to take care of ourselves, both mentally and physically, and not procrastinate as I, I often do or not be diligent, right? It's easy to slip and, and cheat a little and, and just not stay on top of things because it's, it's hard work. You know, at the end of the day, we're, we're supposed to be mindful and take care of ourselves. And, and um, so just as an aside, I spent all of yesterday cleaning out my garage. Right? It was a massive undertaking Wonderful. where... We're redoing the floor in, in, the, in the garage. And so it's literally like 10 hours in the garage taking everything out. And I was, as I was going through it, I was like, wow, this is a very, it's a bit of a, it's certainly a cleansing process to physically yeah. go through something like that. But what occurred to me was, unless we're on vacation at a beach, I think a lot of times we don't go through a mental cleansing like that and dealing with all the, the skeletons in our closet or the baggage that we're like, can, I, I was trying to mm -hmm. imagine if I just spent 10 hours psychologically trying to go through that, that type of deep cleanse. So um, I don't know if you yeah. have any, any thoughts or reactions to that, but that was just an example that I was personally going through 
yesterday about the spring cleaning and physically doing it. But I think as humans, we don't do it psychologically as frequently as we, we might should have to. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, th I think we've lost our skill around searching and questing. So in the brain, you know, there's basically seven main emotional networks. Uh, this is from the work of Jake Pangstep. And the most dominant one is seeking. You know, and I never thought of that as an emotion, but it actually is the most, in, you know, the most we are in control is when we are looking for something. We're leaning in, and it has to do with, you know, your slogan and my slogan of, you know, seek or be, or be sought out, you know, be, be prey or be the one that's kind of consciously taking that in. So I, I would like to see us do a lot more around the skill of questions and questing because we've kind of lost our curiosity with the inundation of information and distraction and uh, intensity of scheduling and the, the pace that we're living at. We've sacrificed our very primal skill of being able to speak for what we want. You know, and so I would say that that's kind of like a an anemia of slow brain time. You know, slow brain time being the sort of system to you know problem solving, creativity, uh, decision making. Those kinds of things are kind of falling to the to the back. And my own sort of mental model for this is that there's probably two divergent sets of humans right now. Um, and I don't know if it's biologically going to evolve in that direction, but there's people who uh, are in a lot of slow brain, and there's people who are living mostly from their fast brain, and they're almost akin to living like a reactive animal, you know? And so um, this, this slower brain group is going to, you know, good or bad, control the, the fast brain group, uh, people who are living reactively, who, who are living like squirrels, you know, attention span everywhere, um, and can't organize their lives. And so the slow brain people need to be compassionate. They need to be people of integrity, people with high values, and people who are willing to uh, share that, their skills and their knowledge with the people who are kind of in a frenetic, stressed situation, right? Um, they could also use their slow brain activity and executive time to hurt people because they have time to, to think about how uh, they could be more selfish. You know, so it doesn't mean that, you know, you're automatically going to be a benevolent slow brainer. It just means that you have uh, influence that other people don't. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. I can, I can totally see how technology is creating those types of issues by constantly offering up distractions. And that also the immediate gratification of information. You don't have to search yeah. very difficultly. I know my, my oldest kid is in fifth grade. And the teacher has given them a couple reports where they have to go to the library, which I think is, <laughs> it's brilliant. Like, because it's yeah. so easy just to go on to Google or ask Alexa the answer to questions to everything. It's like, no, right. we're going to make this a little bit harder right. so you can appreciate the journey more, but also figure out for yourself how to, you know, uncover answers. So uh, the search yeah, to the journey yeah. is great. Um, I, I have uh, daydreams of uh, people setting up Faraday cages in their homes to have a space that blocks out electronic signals so that you can, you can have <laughs> some of that slow thinking time for yourself. Maybe, maybe that's a pipe dream that people will be so well-intentioned to create spaces, but I think what we're going to have a hum, human longing for that type of deep yeah. processing behavior and, and creating physical spaces to do that is, is a potential business model for someone. Um, okay. So we've, we've really sidetracked, but I totally appreciate the comments <laughs> around, around from a, from a patient perspective and the lessons from, from your book. Um, I wanted to ask you a follow-up question to that because you also have the clinical perspective being a mm -hmm. physician. So what would you say are, is, a, is an important lesson or two for our providers that are giving care out to patients in our broader society? 
Yeah. So, you know, I uh, finished medical school in 1998. And at the time, the issue was managed care and how that was starting to put the screws to our time with patients. And from that time to now, I have to say it only got worse. And so physicians are in a time crisis right now. And part of the side effects and the outcomes of that time crisis are burnout. Uh, physicians have the highest rate of suicide. And so we have a real issue where we are, uh, our, our healers of our society are being an indicator species of our overall ecosystem of how our societal well-being is structured. And so I go to, again, I always go to the brain. The brain has four basic neural networks for well-being, you know, one of which is concentration. And so the ability to have that slow brain, that, con that concentrated time to really think through a problem. <clears throat> I went to my physician yesterday because I uh, wanted a MRI scan for my lumbar and sacral region, and they uh, did not authorize that because I hadn't been to my physician in the last 60 days. So there's this algorithm that I got caught up in. I was there 70 days prior. Hmm. but not 60 days prior. So I had to go back in. And, uh, of course, that cha-ching, it, 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 it's going to cost them more money, right? So we're having this conversation, and this physician is a direct primary care physician, and I specifically subscribe to him because I get more time when I need it. I go away for six months, but then I come back, and we spend an hour and a half kind of unpacking things. And in between, I might say, Hey, you know, I got some poison oak and he just writes a prescription for a steroid cream or, Hey, I've got, you know, this and he gives me an antibiotic. You know, I think that's the direction of telemedicine. That's how it's going to end up is these kind of quick transactions and then these longer sort of thought sessions. So if we can structure it like that, I think we start to bring back more the, the skill set that we were trained to do, which is to be a diagnostician to help think through things. And then the question remains, how far is the AI going to go to support that, to really make that more streamlined? And then do we get that time back for humanity? Do we get that time back to connect with each other heart to heart? Or does that mean that the, the MBAs, and I'm not trying to cap on the MBAs, but the, but the folks who control the PNL are going to put the screws and be like, great, the AI saved us five minutes, just five more minutes for another patient to squeeze in there, you know? So it's, it, Really, we're going to have to figure out, you know, what we're going to do to be a well-being system as opposed to a healthcare system. Yeah, I was going to say, call the label the bean counters. Uh, the those yes, who are yes. just trying to squeeze more and more efficiency and and reduce costs. And I think, unfortunately, because costs are so high within <clears throat> our healthcare environment, we are trying to get one more patient in the door or with telemedicine yeah. and email and, and create greater accessibility to our provider community where they're just operating like widgets, processing one after another yeah. versus being as deeply invested with their patient base as they could be because they don't have enough time in a day. And that's leading to yeah. the burnout rates and the suicide rates that you alluded to. And I think, I think we can, I think we can just pretty much dispose of the narrative that, uh, this is all a system based on caring. Um, there are caring moments and there are caring people with good intentions who go into the system. But if you look at the system, the elephant in the room is that the system does everything according to how the money flows and nothing, pretty much nothing that the money does not support. And so, you know, to me, what I've become, and I'm not saying this in a skeptical or jaded way at all, but we've got to be realistic. We, we, we've got to like remove this kind of idealism and this, this narrative on top of like, oh, we're saving people's lives, we're doing this. No, you're doing that because the money is there for you to do that. And then if the money's not there for you to see that person and go to their home and that kind of stuff, you don't end up doing that. And so let's just be honest about what's happening, what's not happening. That way we can figure out, you know, what we need to do uh, business model wise to rejigger the flow of money to support the things that we care about. Uh, you know, the bean counters are under a tremendous amount of pressure too. You know, we have to have compassion for them because the incremental cost, unit cost of these high tech things that are coming into healthcare are one of the drivers that they have to absorb and they don't get any more revenue per patient, you know, 
but they have to buy more and more equipment. You know, they have to get more and more uh, specialty drugs onto the formulary, you know, because we've just innovated so much to, to the incremental cost uh, going up. So I think, yeah, I don't think there's any bad guy and there's no good guy in healthcare. It's just folks, you know, women and men who are trying to uh, contend with the force, the market forces of it. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I, I was with a room of employers, large employers. We were brainstorming new ideas and they were getting very creative with the types of things that they could create, um, put investments towards for their employees and their workforces. Mm-hmm. And at, at one point, I felt a need to help level set the room and say, speaking from a financial perspective, <laughs> which of these ideas hold up? You know, and you know, if we have to justify their existence in two years, three years time, can we chase? all these things that are on this board, because as you said, Mm -hmm. at some point, it's just the reality. It's not being jaded, but yeah, yeah, we have some constraints that we're working in because cost is a factor to consider and we can't just spend money for every amazing thing that we're trying to chase. Right, right. That's right. And, 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 you know, pretty much the reversion to fee for service is nearly complete, you know, um, you know, that there was kind of resistance to change. There was a little bit of bubble with ACA coming in, a lot of disruptive things kicked off a lot of innovation. And then now we're back to, you know, fear for service, transactional medicine, those kinds of things. Right. So if you are a risk holder, like these employers, then you're, you're now, trying to figure out, you know, because now now the healthcare system is pretty much going back to its ways of transacting and you're still at a population health, you know, almost like a capitated model, right? Because you've got a, a pot of money and you've got a number of people and you've got to figure out how that gets allocated. Yeah, totally. I, I think for patients that are out there, uh, we've been talking about consumers, people taking more charge in their decision making, taking better care of themselves, making smarter choices, being engaged. Um, but there are a lot of failings within the overall healthcare experience that lead to dissatisfaction, disengagement. You said you missed the cutoff by 10 days, right? 70 days, you were last there at your doctor. And I think. Physicians <laughs> talking about their own physician experiences are, is always fascinating. It's like, who's, who, do you, who do the experts choose for their own care? But in that example, yeah. you missed the cutoff just by a little bit. And that seems like a failing to me because it's a bad experience for you. It creates more cost and waste and time and efficiency. Uh, what, what would you say are the biggest gaps that we should try to solve for in the day-to-day healthcare experience. So you, you know that I've been on this whole habit science kick. You know, I've been I've been eating habit science for about two years now from a project that we were creating. Um, and so now I think I have this very helpful framework for me, and I wonder if it's helpful for you or our audience here today. I think of everything in terms of a behavior or a habit. You know. So a behavior is my mom gets diagnosed last year with diabetes and she has a series of behaviors that she has to do. She's got to go to her diabetes education classes. She's got to uh, go pick up her medication. She's got to see if insurance covers this or that. Um, She's got to do things. She's got to go get a glucometer, you know, and then there's habits. The habits there that she's got to adopt are eating differently. You know, maybe exercising, which she's never done her whole life. Um, Taking medication, which she's never done before. Uh, Testing her blood sugar, which my mom has a very low pain threshold. That's very traumatic for her. So those are four new behaviors. And if we had a conversation more explicitly about this, uh, we we would be a little more sober, I think, on what is engagement versus not engagement. I'm very, I'm very strict about calling something engagement if it has to do with a person's true engagement with something because it helps them, right? 
uh, getting me to getting you to go to my portal because I put something there that you can only access if you go there is not engagement. It's just hoop jumping, right? You're jumping through the hoops and you're a smart animal. And so you're going to go there, you know, because you, you have a brain. And so to distinguish, if I'm, if I'm going to support you and, and figure out what's good for you, I have to figure out where I'm enlisting you in single behaviors that could be good for you, you know, but also how I'm supporting you with habits. And, and the latter is virtually non-existent in healthcare and in doctor-patient relationships. Um, it's just both because of the time constraint we talked about earlier, but also I think the mental model, we haven't quite gotten clear with ourselves about what it is that we're doing when we have a patient come in every 70, 60 days or, or those kinds of things. Yeah, it's interesting. To me, it, it is a little bit full circle to some of the earlier conversation about yeah. um, learning and being students and searching and figuring out understanding information right. that's out there. It feels like we're being spoon fed so much that that mental model of sitting with your clinician, your provider and learning, what is it that I need to do now to form new habits and what things do I have to adjust or undo in my current life? And just getting to that state of mind to have an open conversation and and be a student about this new mm -hmm. challenge that's in front of you. Uh, yeah. I know I can, as we talk about this, I can feel the shift in my brain about how I would need to readjust attitudes and perceptions in order to be receptive to that type yeah. of change that's being required. But, but if you and I had a conversation about, um, of all the things you could do, Chris, like these are the single behaviors or these are the kind of groups of behaviors that come together. Let's say you've got like a checklist, right? Um, Post-discharge is a good example. Versus here's new habits. Like let's design for those habits in your routine, in your life, in your setup. You know, I, I personally think that at least primary care has a really big role in using a lot of their time just figuring out where the medication that I'm prescribing you should be going in your morning routine, you know? But that conversation is not being had because we don't start with that in medical education. We don't know that skill, but it is a separate skill set, you know, for clinicians and patients. It sounds harder. It, it's certainly much more <laughs> intentional and planful versus the quick fix shortcut, just get it done so I can move on to the next thing attitude that I, I feel like we are running around 24 seven in a rat race for a lot mm -hmm. of things, it, it, you mm -hmm. know, just to sit down and yeah. say, I'm going to really figure this out the right way the first time or, or the fifth time, because I know I've failed the first four times that, that feels more serious. It feels like much more of a commitment and that I don't know, it, for commitment for people as I have some tendencies that sounds harder just to admit that yeah. I need to get more serious about this type of change that I want to undergo. Well, I think, I think again, if your mental model is, look, I can be a squirrel or I can be, you know, a, a higher order thinker, you know, and that metacognitive state that I talked about with the slow brain time. Um, if I want to be a leader in this world, if I want to be an influencer, even a leader of my own behavior, you know, I need to allocate, Slow brain time. There's just no other way to do it. I can't do it while I'm, you know, I'm not smart when I'm doing this other stuff. I'm just being a reactive robot, you know? So yeah, while it might feel like we're getting a lot of stuff done and we're just really inside the, the rat maze and we're not, you know, we're releasing, we're not freeing ourselves from our, our suffering, you know? So for me, freedom is to get more people on the 12 side of the equation to behave naturally like the people who are uh kind of in charge of themselves in charge of in charge of their behavior in charge of organizations you know that's really the model is how do we scale those metacognitive you know those, those, those slow brain uh behaviors to other people because if you look at expert patients for example expert patients to a person are different in one way they 
speak, they lean in, and they gobble up, they eat the world. They, they take that information in, and they synthesize it. And so then they are on par in many cases, and sometimes exceed knowledge of their physician when they go in, and they're running the show. They're basically like, you know, you're my partner in this healing process, but I'm in charge, right? And those people cost less, and they also, um, you know, do better in outcomes, and, and they don't go into you know, so much debt if, they, if, if it's preventable, you know? So all around, that's the better model. Yeah. Those are super experts. But they, they have the commitment and dedication to really take charge, which yeah. you know, in, in our environment, you have to do. You have to look out for yourself and, and figure out what's out there. Okay, so I, I got two last questions. We're going to shift gear We've gone very deep on the individual and what's going on in the brain and the, the chemistry and biology of the science that's driving habit formation, which I love because you know this stuff has to be rooted in science, but that's very much the micro. So if we shift to the, the macro environment that we're experiencing and witnessing in healthcare right now, uh, mm -hmm. A big new development is Haven, which is the work that's being created with Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan. So I got to ask, uh, any thoughts or reactions to what has been seen and reported on and hypothesized with this new player in this environment? Yeah. So, you know, for me, I always think of uh, you know, when a large organization or any organization who has power and resources wants to do something new, uh, you know, it's a function of how long their attention span is on that new thing before it becomes regression to the mean. So having been a part of something like that, similarly at Aetna, where there was like this whole carve out of a new healthcare system and a new model and all those things. Uh, it was. It went through three distinct stages. The so number one was excitement and party, uh, where there was a lot of helium, there was a lot of idealism, there was a lot of exploration, a lot of experimentation, a lot of new. And number two, there was a regression of the mean, which is you know the the forces come back in. The business model was fundamentally not different, you know, and so couldn't sustain new new crops even if you planted them out in the middle of the desert. There was no water for them, right? And then number three, there was kind of a, a disillusion of, um, of talent and people that had been attracted in phase one. And so I'll be curious, that that's typically the life cycle of everything, right? Um, and, and the remainder is how far the first phase went and how embedded in the system it became um, in order to feed itself in number two. Think of it like cancer. Cancer comes in, the first thing it does is throw out angiogenesis, which is like, I need some blood, you know, give me some blood coming in here. So if the haven has thrown out some, some angiogenesis and there's, and there's blood supply coming in, that is regardless of the mood, the attitude, or the relationships of the CEOs at the top, um, then they will survive, meaning that can they get to a business model quickly? Uh, there's two business models that I see there. Number one is they could make things a lot more retail, a lot more convenient, and break down the barriers of uh, misunderstanding, make it simplify it for the consumer, and then they'll get that sort of mass behavior shift uh, that's already happening anyway. I mean, you know, it's just a matter of time before every single ear infection kid and every single person who's sick does not come into an office to get that remedy, you know, and, and just gets help virtually. The second idea is buying power, right? So there's three giant organizations <clears throat> and like onto, you know, just the num by sheer number of lives that they have at their disposal, they can pivot, they can turn their weight around on the cost things. Now, that's a temporary structure at best in many ways because the market forces of pharma and device and those kinds of things are just getting more and more complicated, more and more sophisticated. But I think they could really do some good on sort of the generic side and things like that that 
that have gone out of control for no reason. You know, there's no reason why we should have really expensive generics. It's just a matter of market forces and non-competition that we didn't foresee. So those are the types of things that I think that kind of buying power leverage would really help to uh, provide some balance in the, the economy of healthcare. What do you think? That there, there is a lot there that you just yeah. went through. And I, I think it, it does break it apart um, quite nicely. When, you, when you're talking about the three phases around new ideas, I, I had someone um, tell me that new innovations have a shelf life of three years. And there were some parallels to what, uh, what you were just saying. So I wonder, I wonder if you know, each of those phases takes a year or not. I'm going to wrap it up with uh, our final question here. And going big picture, esoterically, um, and specific to healthcare, you can take this any direction that you want. <laughs> since we've talked about so much in our conversation today, uh, what's one thing about the future that scares you? It scares me. Um, I think that one thing that scares me is us not being able to coordinate, you know, human ability to ascend out of the animal kingdom, as it were, has to do with our ability to collaborate. And if we're not able to collaborate on things like climate change and uh, you know, healthcare and, and saving lives, um, that scares me a little bit. And, and that, that we need to create a social norm that it's not okay to be selfish, that it's not okay to be greedy, it's okay to be abundant, it's okay to be wealthy, but greedy is a different thing. That's when you are cheating. You know, you're, you're, you're not doing things. So, so going back to some of the time-honored ways of behaving as humans that help us to collaborate, that help us to do higher order things that benefit all beings, you know. So that's, that scares me that uh, we won't be able to convince enough people fast enough to be able to save ourselves. You know, and most, most people have it wrong. You know, they think we're saving the planet. Uh-uh. <laughs> we're saving ourselves only and our children and our grandchildren only. And um, that that is the only thing at stake if we don't start collaborating. So I'm really into collaboration these days. I'm really into compassion, as you know, of my recent work. And I think those, those things are the solution. You know, the, there's only love or fear, really, at the base of everything. And so we have to double down on forms of love in business, in healthcare, in relationships, in our own career choices, uh, whatever that is. Uh, we have to come to a place and a base of love or an intention of love at least. Yeah, I want to thank you for that answer because in all the conversations that we've had together some of the words that you use, whether it's empathy, compassion, love, greed, selfishness, you know, the, the emotionality of what you bring into a conversation, I think is different. It stands out. It's authentic. It can be uncomfortable for some. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that discomfort is necessary to really inject some change in, in what's going on. Like, let's be real. Let's talk about some of the real underlying issues and get, get to the, the root of us being humans in this world that we live in. Because I think on that emotional level, that's really where we connect and collaborate and work together as a community and break down those walls. You know, everything's going full circle. That, that opening question and the nonprofit and working with, um, individuals who have been part of gangs and safe and, you know, it's, I, I can see how everything's interconnected between the early work that you've done and what you're focused on today and how it's shaped your perspective. So um, I just want to thank you for that response. Yeah, absolutely. 
Cool. So with that, I think we're at the end of our time and we went in so many different directions. I think we could have spent another hour or two unpeeling some of these questions and responses. But I want to thank you, Kyra, for spending almost an hour together with me. And I want to thank the Health Further team for letting me guest host. And uh, I think depending on how well this recording turns out, they may or may not have me back. So um, with that, hope everyone has an amazing day. And until next time, thank you.